Hello and happy Thanksgiving. Um, whichever style of Thanksgiving you may be experiencing right now. Some people are at home with their families. Some people are just getting drunk at the bar. Sure. Some people um, are doing what's called a Friendsgiving, I'm sure. You're an adult. You live in a city. You might not be going home. I used to call these orphan Thanksgivings. It was a popular term back when I was in my 20s a few years ago. And uh, then a friend of mine got really mad at me because she didn't have any parents. And I didn't think about that. <laughs> So I don't call them that anymore. Now it's called Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving Plus or Batman Thanksgiving. That's another fun way of putting it. Um, anyways, we uh, made a big, long, extra chunky episode for you this week since people are probably driving and flying and stuff like that. And uh, my life is empty and I had nothing to do but make extra podcast content. And I figured we probably should anyway because uh, I've been very busy lately, and and I, I don't know. I want to put some some more content out there for you. Um, so here's what we've got this week. First segment: John F. O'Donnell will be joining us to watch and discuss a very cursed thing. Did you know? that Law & Order SVU did an episode about Jeffrey Epstein. Bet you didn't. It's because it's not a new episode about Epstein. It's from 2011. It's about the first time he got arrested. It's fucking weird as shit. And um, somehow the internet missed it. So check that out while you're, you know, sitting around, taking in tryptophan drinking boxed wine that you snuck out to the garage for or um, getting stoned with your adult cousins. I don't know what the fuck Thanksgiving's like for you people. Um, But yeah, it's on uh, Hulu. It's in season... It's called Flight. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'll put it in the show notes. Anyway, uh... (coughs) Oh, shit, I'm dying. Okay. Whooping cough. We all have whooping cough. Uh, anyways, uh, second part of this episode, um, me and Anders will be talking to Daniel Denver from Jacobin, from the Dig podcast, uh, author of a book on Verso Books, All American Nativism, about how it's the 20th anniversary of the battle in Seattle, um, a protest against the WTO in Seattle. Um, so enjoy both of these. Here's the song that starts the show. What the hell am I talking about? Innocent of crime. Uh oh. <laughs> Lay it down, Alex. <laughs> She's the victim of the other guy. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so good. All right. This is like, um, yeah, <laughs> like a reggaeton or something. Support woman. Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> Really hip hop. Um. <laughs> that would have been a better angle for them to take on Jeffrey Epstein. He's not a military contractor. He's just like a hip hop mogul. They just made him like. Uh, <laughs> He's just. <laughs> was like his name Sean. Uh, He's the dude that went to Jamaica and Puff found Daddy. Shaggy. It's Sean Puffy Combs. Sean it's Puffy Combs. Jeffrey Epstein. Sean Epstein Combs. Yeah. They and then they, like they drag in that guy who held his umbrella for questioning, <laughs> Bentworth Fornsley or whatever. Remember that guy? 
The umbrella guy? There was a guy who's like, whole, he was in all of Puffy's videos for a while, who's just like this dude who wore a suit and like looked kind of uh, foppish in his job legally was that he held umbrellas for Puff Daddy. Damn, oh, yeah. Cool. He's in all the Outcast videos and I shit. lose all I of my umbrellas, name. too, so it has a practical element to it. Oh, yeah. Because you would never lose your umbrellas with a made umbrella, man. It seems... Uh, uh, like excessive and decadent and almost insulting to the man's soul but i mean <laughs> come on has <laughs> anyone have... kept an umbrella for more than like six months you gotta get <laughs> a little umbrella man butler <laughs> no. a lot of them are like single use umbrellas now you can hate me now did we start Bump. oh we're but starting baby hello man. everyone <laughs> <Bump>. <laughs> welcome to pod damn america the gothic socialist podcast for Los Niños Estúpidos. Uh, welcome to the show. The Stupid Children. The Stupid Children. Um, I'm Jake Flores. <laughs> Alex Patax here. Hey, what's up, Stupid Children? Um, and welcome back to the show, John F. O'Donnell. Goofy Grapes, motherfucker. What's up, you guys? I want to say thanks. Since my last appearance, I've been getting a lot of people tweeting me the grapes emoji. So that's like a subculture thing. Now. A lot of love. Tweet it at him. That's good. <laughs> Send him the grapes emoji. Send me them grapes. That's just going to be worth something Send down me them the line. Grapes. That's good uh, Twitter real estate, you know, because like no one's made that emoji. It doesn't mean anything yet. Yeah. You could make it yours. Is it not balls? It is. <laughs> is it's, it balls? It's, what, it's a bunch of green balls? I mean, purple balls? Yeah. Well, it would have to be like a sack of eight balls or whatever. No, I, I don't Yeah, I guess it could be purple <laughs> balls. Come on. Get it trending. It's four <laughs> guys' in the chat. testicles. That's yeah. what that means. Bunched together. In yeah. In terms of... Four guys' testicles that haven't quite gotten to blue yet. <laughs> <laughs> like, they haven't hooked up in a while, but not that long. Yeah. So it means that really specifically, and also John F. O'Donnell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think you're still doing pretty good. That's Don't the forget kind of about, energy yeah. you bring to a podcast. Yeah, and it's for anybody like four that doesn't... guys yeah. who need to bust. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah, four of them. <laughs> that That's really powerful. <laughs> we want to thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> that's both powerful and lonely at the same time. Also, for people that don't have a context for the grapes thing that are listening right yeah, now. because your episode was behind the paywall yeah so that's on you guys that's on you actually <laughs> yeah sign yeah. up for our patreon and listen to john's incredible tale about um goofy grapes and tulsi gabbard <laughs> tulsi gabbard <laughs> and, uh, are you intrigued <laughs> yeah are you gonna tweet the grape emoji at her now are you guys gonna do that well, I mean, I have a. She won't know what it means. I have a closer relationship with Carol Gabbard, her mom, as we all know. Oh. Carol, leave Carol alone. Well, it's interesting. Not you, them. I mean, <laughs> that we're discussing grapes, since the grape emoji representing four ball sacks is actually pretty similar thematically to what we're here to discuss today. That was a pretty good impression of an Anders Lee segue. I respect it. <laughs> hey everyone, did you know that? <laughs> Law & Order SVU did an episode about Jeffrey Epstein in 2011, eight years ago. With all of the details in it. It's fucking weird. <laughs> it came out eight years ago when he got arrested the first time, and it has, like, a Ghislaine Maxwell and a bunch of other really oddly prescient details. And um, It has everything but his egg-shaped penis, specifically. My theory on this is because, like, Law & Order is a mirror of the news. Like, they draw their... Uh, their content for their like stories of the week from the news. They're ripped from the headlines. They didn't know about his egg-shaped dick. Therefore, they could not write that into the show. Okay. We know about it now because like... Um, because we listen to podcasts. Yeah, because, <laughs> because of that fucking podcast. They're afraid to do that at SVU. <laughs> the egg-shaped know. dick had not revealed itself yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, was that information like out, or was that did that well, come I around this that, time around? I think it, that was old news. I'm pretty sure. Oh well, then yeah, there should have been a woman crying in this episode, like, and it looked like an egg. It was an egg. <laughs> well, there is this an fucked egg. up. There is this fucked up montage in the episode where it's a number of young girls crying about what happened to them, 
if every one of them was like, and it looked like an egg, <laughs> and it looked like an egg, and it was an egg. <laughs> I don't know if that would have. It's one of those things where it would have been too funny. Yeah, for them exactly. To air. <laughs> exactly. Um, I will say this is my favorite episode of Law and Order SVU we have watched for Pod Damn America, of which this is number three, I believe. I was going to say, you're not. You guys, neither of you guys are familiar, like, really watch this show. I fucking historically have hated this show because cool. to me it's like too fucking cringing and tragic, and I don't want to do that with my like entertainment time. You don't want to watch but, sex victims in your free time? No, everything's like rape and incest, and it's fucked. And I understand that it's like real or whatever. And some people love the show. A lot of friends of mine love it, but it's never been my cup of tea. You're Honestly? not like a true crime person. You don't like that. I'm actually I'm not I'm not like another 48 hour first 48 hours or whatever the fuck it is what's your preferred yeah. genre gr- goofy grapes me yeah I don't know I like but it's bizarrely that something I watched recently is like I like Mindhunter well then well you- that is true crime <laughs> but besides that yeah. one I haven't been into it you well know? that was a bad example to give <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't know I guess I don't know what I'm into the only I'm- TV show I've ever watched <laughs> is Mindhunter <laughs> and now this <laughs> Maybe well, I'm changing because I like this episode. We simply must move forward. Jake, you've seen a lot of <laughs> SVU. Yeah. No, Where does this rank on your SVU scale? That's why this, these episodes are so weird to do with you guys because, like, I in my I everyone I know watches SVU. It's a fun thing to watch when you're hungover or um, or 65 or uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I can't pinpoint what exactly makes true crime popular. There are some hot opinion pieces on the internet this week about uh, just this topic. Oh, my favorite murder. Uh huh. And how they're pro they're pro cops. Kind of, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, this show's just goofy as shit to me. Like it's just like, uh, I guess it's the uh, detachment, I suppose. So, so this episode didn't stick out to you compared to other ones you've seen. No, it was good because I the Epstein connection yeah, yeah they're funny when they're like you know what they're about in real life you know what that's the fucking game for me with law and order is when you can tell what it's about in real life and you can kind of imagine the person watching it and getting pissed off that they got some of the details wrong and stuff ah. and like, that's not what i look like and stuff damn and uh um, my murders were nothing like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah this one was pretty fun i used a fork i think i like this one more because of knowing somewhat about the story that's kind of why but also i know maybe this is like played out but i love that ice t used to like wrote the song cop killer yeah and right. isn't a cop on tv for years and i made my mom buy me that tape <laughs> wow. cassette that was behind the counter at sam goody when it still had the cop killer track on it That's it's really cosmic ironies that he's on the show it's like a 180 degree turn and he's like <laughs> always trying to defend it on twitter and like oh still is he, it still like a thing or he gets what? really mad at his reply guys and he's just like listen it's a paycheck motherfucker yeah, but like buy xboxes it is ironic that in this episode like at one point he's uh talking to the epstein characters like house manager who acts as uh the guy who pays off his victims and shit and he yells you're a pimp at him but not in like a positive way (laughs) you're a pimp keep it up you're a pimp like the representation i made of myself for my first four solo albums (laughs) yeah (laughs) he's saying it admonishingly but it's like but people very often say that in hip-hop the other thing you work in as a compliment right this is confusing he meant he's one of the bad pimps (laughs) he's not union right right that's what it is (laughs) I would love to see the pimps union. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They go on strike and they don't sell women for the whole month. After uh, 200 (laughs) shifts uh, uh, pimping out women, you turn in your binder and they give you a big white top hat. Yeah, like the, pl- <laughs> like the players' ball and the pimps' union don't get along or something. Because- They're calling it the purple hat movement. <laughs> pimps all across the country. Another thing about Law and Order that's bothering me is like I have, I have like a Law and Order based punchline that is one of my favorite things I wrote that's not working. Yeah, or very quickly we can all workshop this for a while. I'm yeah, okay, but, let's uh, beat this out. <laughs> but I basically say I'm like. Yeah, but I have bipolar disorder. Whatever. Like I have a very mild version of the disease, and the nearly twenty years I've had, I've only had ten extreme manic episodes, six prolonged clinical depressions, and more psychiatric hospitalizations than seasons of Law and Order. Oh yeah, and I think that that's to me is funny. But it, nobody really laughs. Well, maybe you're operating under the same delusion I am, which is that I just assumed everyone watches this show all the time because, like, I do. And but everybody, at least, do. yeah. And it's also very common 
trope in stand up. Really? Is people Law know what Law and Order is. But isn't does everybody know that it's been on forever? I think you and can comparing seasons of a television show to the amount of You can understand the number, but maybe feel like it's correct but not that funny. Now, if it was yeah. referring back to you discussing Law and Order before, then I feel like that would be funny. You well, I don't like it. the show enough to write another <laughs> Law and Order pre- like a prequel joke for that well, maybe this to work. Well, like you just pick line. a different example of a of a thing that's funnier. I was saying in the population of India. <laughs> but that's, no, you know. that seems weird to say. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> that's a lot of people. That's a lot of manic episodes. Know, but that's, if you do I the know, but that's the, a, You should say, like the, oh, oh. I've had more manic episodes than Jeffrey Epstein has molested children. Yes. <laughs> there are children that have been raped by Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> Any crowd will like this. <laughs> you can play it anywhere. No, dude, I feel like, honestly, though, I've been referencing Jeffrey Epstein just off the cuff doing stand up lately, and it's never not worked. Like, everyone's following this to some extent, or at least the types of people that would go to comedy shows. Yeah, but, like, a, I don't know, like a Jeffrey, like then Jeffrey Epstein. Eh. Oh, no, don't do this. No, I no, was joking. Don't, definitely, don't <laughs> no. It's a bad line. No, okay. This is horizontal thought. We're discussing something else. <laughs> this is, this is, do not insert a rape reference into your <laughs> self help. As an example. I just thought, I just thought comparing hospitalizations to seasons of Law and Order, like, it's so interesting to me. When I'm like off on something that I'm like, ooh, this is fucking great. And what if and it's then more not. hospitalizations than, you know, something they have at the hospital? You know, just thinking out loud here. Uh, doctors at the then hospital. Doctors at the hospital. That's not going to work either. Basically, you have a catchphrase you could sneak in? The only thing is, is like, I, I have the bravado. Bella. I have the bravado to hear. <laughs> we'll explain the Bella thing in a minute, you guys. I have the bravado to be like, oh, within the first couple minutes of my stand up set, I'm going to tell people I've been in the psych ward, and that's how I'm going to use comedy to destigmatize this fucking thing. But it's just no version of the joke I've written is working yet. What if Jeffrey Epstein survived then he used comedy to destigmatize what he did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Listen, I've been to my own island more times than there are doctors in the hospital. <laughs> Listen, Folks. I got an egg-shaped penis. The only thing it responds to is young pussy. They say this motherfucker's got an egg-shaped penis. <laughs> <laughs> Belzer's like... God damn right he does. When I tell you I have an egg-shaped penis, trust me, it is green grass fed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cage-free. Cage-free. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, you got a, a crack a few egg-shaped penis to make a few omelet-shaped yeah. rape charges against oh young girls. God. Belzer's like, I don't think I'll be ordering that over hard <laughs> or over easy or something. Do we, do we want to talk about uh, what... Ha- we don't have time to recap the whole episode, probably, but we could talk about some highlights, you know. Let's just talk about the episode. We're like 12 minutes into this. We're good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> listen, this is a, it's an interesting artifact, I guess. There is a, a law and order about the first time he got arrested, which clearly... Because it was just like a non, it wasn't like um, all connected to you know the grand fucking uh, um, Pizza Gate or like um, Bill Clinton is not mentioned in the episode. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like this is just something they clipped from the newspaper and then went like, oh, here's a weird story they this actually, week. They do say a former president is at the party, but it's not like and it's the Clintons and he's been on a plane with him every day for a year. Well, that can only be one of so many people. That actually is kind of damning. Yeah, you know, it's tricky, Willie. It's J- fucking Carter. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he's planting his peanut-shaped dick. And all these young girls, the peanut farmer. Jimmy Carter decided to stop helping people in Latin America in order to come back and get his dick wet. So Jimmy Carter does a lot of really good work in Latin America <laughs> post his presidency. That you have to know. <laughs> if only Andrews was here. <laughs> <laughs> they say he built a house on a secret island because he built houses. Okay, they uh, mention the island. They do mention the island just casually. So it's weird that in 2011, like even when this guy went to jail for like 13 months of like vacation jail, they knew essentially most of the shit we know now then that's why this is so weird because it's just like 
it's not that it's casual. And I mean, it, it's a it's a like a story on Law and Order, which is an intense story. But it's the fact that it's told on Law and Order, and then like nothing happened, and no right, one really thought about it. It's frustrating that there's like a media blackout on this thing, and the like news doesn't take it seriously. But then the fact that we have like a fake version of it on TV, <laughs> on TV, that people wrote multiple drafts of the script to get right, <laughs> like figured out what was working to get it accurate. You know, and you're right because you said that when he first got arrested, there was a number of other things that they couldn't get him on, right? Right. Or Charges and stuff like that. But they didn't on. get him on. They got him in 2008 for solicitation of an underage girl. Yeah. And so this story tracks kind of one-to-one with the first time he was arrested back then, which was, um, let's see, in the, in the fictionalization, there is a young French woman named Dominique who is right. uh, like a teenager, right? You're going to want to say she's a dominique Tris. But you can't <laughs> because you can't. she's only 12 years old. Well, that's what he accuses her of. Right. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, but how do they like how does she how do they bring her in again? I guess. OK, so she the opening scene of the episode is they're on a French plane and then somebody reaches to close the window next to her and she wakes up and she's like, Zut alors on the rape. And then somebody <laughs> slams them into a countertop and it's pretty funny, just like the guy next to her. And they're like, she's saying she's been French raped. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and that's how it starts. <laughs> we recognize she has PTSD from a rape that happened before. And that's when we're introduced to the Jeffrey Epstein character, who in this is a weapons contractor named Jordan Hayes. The guy who this is my other favorite thing about Law and Order. It's just like chock full of character actors, so everyone has this vague, uncanny feeling like you've seen them in something because you have, but you, you can't quite place have. them. It's but, a real dreamlike feeling. Yeah, this guy. Uh, I looked up his IMDb. He's in like a million things. One of the weirdest ones is uh, he played Pierre Trudeau in a Canadian biopic. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, but in this, he just he looks like. Um, in, when he plays his Jeffrey Epstein character, Jordan Hayes, he looks uh, somewhere between Max Dad from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and like a scary magician. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like with the yeah. pencil mustache and stuff. That's did a good assessment. Did you think he was Max Dad? <coughs> Is that why you looked it up? Um, I don't remember why. Doesn't I look good. No, I don't know. It's a I good... have a compulsion. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan Hayes. I thought he was uh, Willie Mays Hayes from Major League and Whiteface. That isn't interesting to think he was. <laughs> uh, so I wrote that down in my notes. I was like, oh, if I'm not talking for a while, I'll say that. Willie Mays Hayes, just in case. I'll say when I say that, that's going to pop. So uh, <laughs> in, the, in the show, uh, they, they, they start investigating Jordan Hayes, but they notice that he's very wealthy and has a lot of powerful friends, so he's kind of untouchable. But they investigate who else was at this party where the rape supposedly happened. And uh, not only is it Dominique, who's 12, but it's her friend, whose name is... Nicole, maybe? Nicole. Nicole. Interesting footnote about the actress who played Nicole. She died in a head-on collision two weeks after they filmed this. Are you fucking kidding me? Shut the fuck up. Yeah, dude. That makes me so depressed. It's crazy. Also, what if it was Epstein? You why know? would it be? Why would he just kill her? I don't know. He had to have seen he this. Have Here's another Richard layer. Belzer. Yeah. Epstein has to have seen this episode of Law. Well, he doesn't have to kill all of them. He just has to kill one to as a, a f- send a message. And it would be the young girl. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. The, nom nom saying. <laughs> <laughs> you feel me? She died um, two weeks later. Yeah. Uh, Man, that is a super bummer. But it's um, crazy. This is all to get to the very interesting part of this, which is the character they took the most liberties with, I feel like, on this episode, which is Dahlia, who is essentially Ghislaine Maxwell, right. who procures the girls from him and is his on and off girlfriend. Here's the most interesting thing to me about this, is that in the 2011, when they wrote this, they knew enough to include the Ghislaine Maxwell character and to incorporate her connections to uh, the fashion industry. Because at one point... In the like uh, the back and forth, uh, you know, the second act of this when they're trying to figure out whether or not these uh, um, accusations are real or if they're you know trying to get something out of them, um, one of the uh, girls gets paid off. The Nicole character gets cl- like clearly paid off with a deal where she's on the cover of something called Faux Magazine, which is like right. a like a fictional fashion yeah. magazine or whatever. Fictional magazine. Which is <laughs> close to what was going on with Victor- Victoria's Secret. At least uh, there being a connection there at all. Infuriating. Yeah, like all of the details from the real case are there. I understand when you make a TV episode, 
you don't actually want to exactly reproduce real life because real life isn't dramatized like this. So I think this is why they take so many uh, leads with Dahlia. But the character of Dahlia, they're like investigating for the show. And the farther they push in, the more guilty she feels. And so she tries to OD. And uh, that's when they kind of get her into the police station. Yeah. And it's just an entirely different portrayal of this woman who is, A, I mean, older than the one they have on the show, but then also, like, much more involved in the process than kind of, like, passively doing this stuff. Yeah, it's weird. They're Actually, you know what? So they got two, they got two things switched around, um, which is they, uh, they pin all the blame for assisting the Epstein character on his like assistant that works in his house. And then they sort of, uh, yeah, they're very sympathetic to the Ghislaine Maxwell character in real life. Ghislaine Maxwell was like his right hand person. And, uh, there's a guy who like, it's a real victory for feminism. This case. There's a guy who quit working for him in real life, who was like an assistant around the house. And that's how the, uh, his, uh, one of his books got leaked that had all his like, contacts in it and shit right one of the first big leaks had just like a million you know famous people the one with like oh, wow. oh jackie chan was in the room <laughs> yeah. at the same time oh, no. as Chris tucker and they had a <laughs> devious rush hour experience <laughs> oh no yeah malcolm gladwell was in that one wow yeah it's fucked up i heard he Holy spent ten thousand hours in that room <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> what my response? Yeah, this is funny. Bueller. They, <laughs> okay, I like when I get that kind guys, of the the Bueller thing. <laughs> is, oh, am I gonna explain the Billy thing to people? Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a, from a weird okay. riff we got yeah, on. He did, a, he did a riff. I We're did just a, riff. a little pressed on time, is all. But uh, do you have fun. to get out of here soon? I mean, I do. But okay. we'll, when, we, when we end, we end. Yeah. Okay. I did like some of the uh, the kind of snarky lines. Um, there were great lines. You know what is the uh, the female detective's name? Main female detective uh, of all the episodes. Yeah, You're good. I only know them wow, by their. If actresses. you don't know that, <laughs> hold on. It's uh, like sexist. Mar- Mariska Hargitay in real life. Yes. Well, Detective Mariska. <laughs> detective Hargitay. When she said, uh, I, "Yeah, I bet." Oh, this, Olivia Benson. Olivia course. Benson, of course. Uh, when she said, "I bet, I bet his glass ceiling is the mirror over his bed." That was, was badass. a pretty fucking badass yeah, line. Also, she was right. All right, let's talk about this fictional Epstein scene a little bit. Uh, Jordan Hayes. So he's introduced as the guy who's implicated in the uh, rape of this 12-year-old character. and He flips it. He's, he's called in, and he's sort of like got a shitty grin on his face the whole time, and he's like, I didn't do nothing. And uh, the crime he's sort of accused of is that he has a massage room, and he was getting a massage at a birthday party at his house. It was his birthday. And the um, the 12-year-old girl was his present. The 12-year-old girl was his present, right? That's sick fuck. What are you going to do, reject a present? It's just rude. (laughs) He comes in. Different cultures. After he's been accused of (laughs) raping this girl via this, you know, like, massage situation. And the big twist that leads us into Act 2 is that he goes, she raped me. Right. I'm a victim of rape. This 12-year-old girl raped me. Big pop in the room when that happened, by the way. And uh, the way... <laughs> it was very weird and funny. Yeah. Uh, My popcorn went flying in the air. <laughs> because... Yeah. Um, it's a real hot take on the situation. Then there's sort of a question of, like, uh, you know... Why do you have a massage room? And he just sort of trails off into like, you know, <laughs> my <you> get- <laughs> back hurts. <laughs> no, he said his back hurts and it has a spiritual component. <laughs> yeah. Which is. <laughs> and then his lawyer's like, shut the fuck up. And his lawyer's like, all right, we don't need to get into that. Well, it's also true. It's not germane. His lawyer's also here with him for it, which is, you know. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. is Robert Klein, like a uh, stand up comedian for forever. Really? Is that guy yeah. a comic? That's why I kept saying, guys, it's Robert Klein. Oh, that's why you guys didn't respond. No, I had no idea what we were talking I didn't about. Hear you say Robert it. Klein, stand up comedian. <laughs> Character actors. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Robert Klein. Well, he's doing good. Maybe he can help me workshop that Law and Order punchline that's not working. <laughs> law and Order. What were you, you said, uh, as many clouds as there are in yeah. the sky. That's a, there's a lot of clouds. As many times as my Robert Klein reference is going to not work. <laughs> Biller. Okay, so Biller. Character actors are in famous show, <laughs> Law and Order Special Victims Unit. As much as you can almost figure out the name of these character actors. Um, so 
<laughs> the massage thing is like also true to the Epstein case in that they all sort of uh, everyone who's been implicated in the Epstein shit just sort of tries to write it off as like you just get massages you don't know how old the girl is my back also hurts this is a I have not gotten a massage maybe ever like yeah. a would you go to a massage place? Yeah, we can tell. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> uh is this like a thing that uh, rich people just get like three massages a day like this? When I got married, they gave me a coupon and I went for one. So I've got one. Yeah. Oh, and I had a temporary job once where they gave you them at the office, but that was not the same. I went to a couple's one once that we got a group on for. It was nice. Yeah, but if you're not doing it as a couple, and also it's by a 12 year old girl, it is a bit suspicious. Yeah, <laughs> and you're right. I don't even think I don't think rich people get three a day. I don't think it's like. I don't think that's a thing. No, well, it is when you're a serial sexual predator. But <laughs> even his, even the fake him describing it was like the party was in full swing, and I turned the light off in my massage room and waited for my present. Here's what I'm saying about. Epstein like in real life as told through this character he always talks about just how there's like parties happening and then he just leaves the party to go get a massage that's fucking weird right yeah if I'm throwing a house party at my own place and I'm like hey, be right back guys I'm gonna go <laughs> well I mean in situations where you're not doing crime it actually can be a cool ass kind of thing to do like I need to be alone sometimes because I'm so uh, emotional yeah but like in the middle of a Halloween party that you invited all your friends to at your apartment that's <laughs> Sometimes Weird. the real spooky ghost is depression. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go. Face you just it don't the understand the Goth mega rich, guess. dude. You just don't understand. He's like spooky the. Ghost. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I don't know. So then they uh, investigate his room where he gets his massages, and there's a TV next to the massage bed, which. He goes like, yeah, I like to watch TV when I get a massage. And then they just press the on button. Yeah, there's and a hunch that maybe <laughs> something's weird with the TV. <laughs> it reveals that the, the, ca the, the fucking TV is hooked up to a camera that's just in the ceiling, like the <laughs> mirror joke. So he can like watch from a bird's eye view the massage he's getting. Yeah. And then also have them later for... You know, the purposes of showing to his friends and family. Oh, you know oh, right. who else had that? Um, uh, <laughs> who's that other famous celebrity who's a sex criminal? Oh, um, R. Kelly <laughs> had all of his shit recorded all the time. Yeah. I think if you are like a power crazed like person with a messiah complex, you just start recording yourself. Yeah. Well, in the Epstein case, they also, like, found a bunch of tapes in a safe in his place. Yeah. They've cracked open his safe, and it was full of jewels and, like, foreign money, and then tapes that just said, like, Bill Clinton and a date. <laughs> but for some reason, they were, I can't remember the exact Jackie reason. Jackie Chan, parentheses, not funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the tapes Sex stuff. were, like, uh, inadmissible in court or something, but he was clearly using them to, like, blackmail the people that he had come yeah. get massages massages quote unquote at his like weird island thing right so I guess that's like another uh, purpose for them or something um, it's just wild how much of this we knew eight years ago to me yeah, I thought it really this is. was more new information um, yeah. other things that happened this episode okay so at, at one point when they're getting close to cracking the case uh, on uh, Dominique's favor Nicole the slightly older girl who got Dominique to the party, calls them and says that actually Dominique is just like that bitch. And she's always out trying to grab cash. And they're like, oh, this fucks our case. And then they immediately see her on the cover of a fashion magazine uh, for faux fashion. Yeah, because she made a yeah. deal. Because it's but a favor. they she's couldn't like... track the money through the manager and stuff like that. So it was just circumstantial. So they still couldn't get the warrant. But, uh, but yeah, when Jordan Hayes was in... And he was saying that he got raped by this girl. He was also saying that if he stopped and didn't let this girl have sex with him, that she was going to say that she was raped. Like she entrapped him. Yeah. Right. Which, you know, is not a thing that has ever happened. Well, that's the kind of like fucking discussion that keeps happening now when you get... Uh, uh, you know, a celebrity who's taken down publicly, they're like, me too has gone too far. But this is in 2011. 
and they're having the same discussion. Well, this has just always been a thing that people will do to defend rapists. It's yeah. like create a situation where it's like that person was trying to, you know, that 12 year old was trying to get into the weapons dealing business. By- <laughs> <laughs> she wanted an arms contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is really weird. They made him like I was going to say pure villain, like even <laughs> e- more evil. You know? Yeah. Well, he already is pretty bad, but they just like I don't know. They make Hedge these fund, like not evil enough. <laughs> Give him a gun. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other funny thing that happens, I think, is when they take him in, like near the end when they're about to get him. Uh, they put him in like just the jail cell that's just in the office in the Law and Order set. Um, with just like another unspecified sex offender, and it's just this guy who looks like Emo Phillips, who's he's smelling him and shit. Right, right, right. Well, the the fun thing about this show, I mean, you said they're all character actors, but you can tell anyone who has a three second role on this is like auditioning to be a star <laughs> forever. So the guy who's even playing like pedophile number two is like you knew here i got my own story <laughs> he's like he is doing the role of his life here on epstein episode five of it makes sense season though 12 of law and order some of those actors start off in smaller roles on law and order and then like they finally break it you know they come home one day to their family and they're like honey i get to be the rapist this yeah, week yeah. i was thinking yeah, about when dude. they had that montage of girls in the middle and she was like and then he was in my panties <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is definitely a lot of girls first tv credit <laughs> just, for sure just fucking swinging for the fences <laughs> yeah yeah oh, sexually abused girl number four yeah, i can be that put me in more tv but that is the thing law and order is a first tv gig for a lot of like struggling actors in New York for right. sure it's yeah a, it's a great awareness organization yeah and it's you know you get, you get to start off your IMDB page with either rapist or rape victim <laughs> which yeah. makes everyone comfortable on your next big read you the know? two genders <laughs> um, but yeah they do have a montage scene of all of these different girls coming out and it is like it's weird because it is, you know, you don't want to be like cynical and jokey and snarky about it, but it's like they're being very emotional, but it's also the acting is kind of over the top and it's it a little for funny. It is like television that comes on at 3 p.m. Yeah, so, it's you know. soap opera. <laughs> hey, don't have no fun out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they finally are able to, uh, through the power of hacking the blogosphere. Bells are catfishes, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bells are fucking forgot about that. Right, we have to talk about this. Was this was the best like display the entire episode because it shows his process of doing <laughs> French catfishing. It's just on AIM with a big picture of like a tiny girl and he's like, "She le for a pedophile." <laughs> I'm waiting to crack her. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, talking to just Pepe Le Pew on the yeah. other end. <laughs> yeah, the, he was playing Gigi Fernandez. That was like the most accurate cop shit they were doing on the show was just trying to entrap a 12-year-old girl <laughs> in France on the other side of the world. <laughs> um, yeah, so they eventually are able to triangulate and get uh, all, a bunch of people to come forward, and then they use that to put away both uh, Jordan Hayes slash Epstein and the Dahlia Maxwell Ghislaine character. And then like the big ending is... Uh, her realizing that he's going away to like a cushy golf course. What do you call it? Club fed. Club fed type he's going situation. To club fed. And then she's just going to go to straight up prison for like 80 years. And she's like, no, I never should have trusted you. I just did it because I loved you or whatever. Out of love. Yeah, it's like a godfather scene. I'm just like, you said I was your only girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was really creepy because he walked up to her. And they're both in handcuffs. And yes, for some yes. reason, all the police let him, let him do this. He like put his hands on both of her cheeks and she kind of like still melted into him right showing that she's been so groomed because he's a monster that he has this control over her by the way the detectives are disgusted (laughs) yeah yeah they do not stand for this there are some really good cutaway shots of the detectives just looking disgusted throughout the episode oh yeah Maloney (laughs) yeah he's so mad grimacing Maloney really hated the island he was like really bitter about that throughout goddamn island he's like oh you got your own island too he's got his own island I'd like to go to an island I'm an NY 
NYPD detective. I make $68,000 a year. This is crazy. He has his own fucking island? I'd like to go to an island that is in Manhattan for once. <laughs> what? The only <laughs> island I've been on. Ask what islands I've been to. We know. You don't Manhattan. Have, I don't have an island. <laughs> Staten. I'm always in Staten. <laughs> Rikers. Rikers. I'm in a Rikers. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's an island. I'd like to send this guy. <laughs> I just feel like you're really hung up on the island. Well, I don't got one. They should have let us write this shit <laughs> 11 years ago or whatever. Nine, whatever. Um, eight years ago. Yeah, I don't know. So the, there we have it? the ending, which is uh, not true to life as we know now because uh, he obviously in real life eventually got murked and then Jelaine Maxwell is just like probably also murked <laughs> probably dead maybe just in the wind somewhere yeah you know we don't know that in and out burger picture was fake right it was uh photoshopped and that was the last time we've seen her and in the nice show uh he goes to a comfy jail and then uh she goes to a real jail because they had a true love that cannot be changed end of episode yeah <laughs> executive producer Dick Wolf dun 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 <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's it. Do you want to get out of here? So, yeah, feels bad um, to know that this has just been in the open for eight years. It makes me think that we're going to get probably no more closure coming up. They are trying his guards yeah they're gonna put the isolation i don't know if we've talked about that before but that is clearly some cover-up bullshit that they're even just saying on the news like that's their defense is like um this is clearly a cover-up oh this line doesn't work Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Oh man, if you're a if you're, if you're a, a guard, and, guard you... and then you get sent to prison, that you are not gonna do well. The prison guards are black, right? Yes. Yeah, they're totally just gonna pin this on two black guys. Yeah. They're like, you're responsible for the island and the plane, and they're like, What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to go to an island. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any island that doesn't have rats on it. I've been to Staten, Rikers, Manhattan. It's not an island if it's That's got rats. It. That's a joke I say sometimes. Oh, you like <laughs> islands, do you? The guard's like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> We're going to send you an island called Rikers Island. Manhattan, now there's an island with as many rats as there are episodes of Law & Order SVU. Some of these rats I know, we call them CIs. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Confidential right. informants. Tip your waitress. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my takeaway from this. What other Law & Order episodes are out there that are full of this much damning truth that we have no idea? Right. You know? Go back through them. Wow. Come That's going to take these. years and years to maybe <laughs> catch up to. We could, you know, we could we could uh, get on the case and solve some, some current shit. <laughs> I love solving current shit. You know? Maybe by watching uh, season 11 or whatever of uh, Law & Order. Maybe we figure out who... Uh, I don't know. Are there any serial killers happening right now? Are there any other big mysteries in the news? My wife just keeps handing me job applications. I'm like, no, I'm solving current shit. (laughs) I have to watch all of it. (laughs) I can't right now. I can't do the census. I have to watch all of it. (laughs) I'm becoming a PI. Jake told me to solve mysteries, so that's what I'm doing. It's for the podcast. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to watch this show. Oh, no. (laughs) Was that even? Was anyone gonna do that? I'm not watching more. Dude, people that. fucking love Law and Order. You guys are weird. You have a wife. What? Yeah. Your wife doesn't watch Law and Order. No. I'm hesitating to make she it. She watches just a... good TV, Jake. What you watch? Mind Hunter. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I do. One of the only shows. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why when you guys asked me that I couldn't think of anything else because the only I other thing I watched. to me right now. I watched uh, Dairy Girls is the most recent thing I watched on Netflix and it's like this comedy about takes place during the 90s in Northern Ireland during Jeffrey the Jeffrey Epstein is in it. In Derry and it's like really fucking funny. Jeffrey Epstein is the but, one Protestant in Northern Ireland and it's really tense. Yeah. My takeaway from the show is that I like some of Ice T's lines. I like when he said, well, "What if, what if he was a blue collar kitty diddler?" That was a fucking. That was funny. That was the way one. he said it. Yeah, not the way I said it. What if he was a blue collar kitty diddler? Well, <laughs> I said it the same way yeah, both times. You just said it the way you say most things. Just like just a hint of a jazzy guy character. All right. Um, but, 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 uh, John F. O'Donnell, where can our listeners find you and listen to your stuff? Yeah, uh, all the social media at the real JFOD. Um, and I got 
a podcast in the works to keep an eye out for. It's called Take Your Pills, Psychopath. Uh, it's a comedy, a deep <laughs> dive into all things mentally ill. And in the meantime, uh, email mentally me Bill. at takeyourpillspod at gmail.com uh, to let me know what you want to hear about. Uh, takeyourpillspod at gmail.com. Anything you want to talk about with your mental health issues, I will uh, read it on the show and make fun of it um, and exploit your your most painful emotions for uh, for listens. Well, unfortunately, no one who's mentally ill has ever listened to this podcast, so <laughs> shit out of luck. It's a bunch of normies. This is an episode for just like cool ass guys, actually, <laughs> but uh, and <laughs> gals. Um, cool. Follow me on Twitter at Patak Jokes, and if you enjoyed a recap of a television show, you will love the Ball and Out Super podcast, which now just does random anime <laughs> recaps and not Dragon Ball Super because we literally ran out of episodes. <laughs> and you can vote on which shit we're gonna watch too it's fun so check that out that's it for me all right i got a bunch of shows uh they're on my website and my twitter um bu- 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 coming to phoenix next week and bisbee and uh some other cities in the southwest megabus tour next year oh i'm on 51st jokes at the beginning of the year hosted Yay. by John F. O'Donnell. Billy. <laughs> My brother. John F. O'Donnell and Billy. No, by John F. O'Donnell, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's January 3rd at the Bell House. Get them ticks. That shit sells out. It's a big-ass, good-ass show. Uh, hola, Thanksgiving Gothic Ninos. Um, hope you enjoyed the dumb-as-hell portion of the show, the Law & Order SVU Jeffrey Epstein episode from 2011 with John O'Donnell. That was a lot of fun. Um, but now moving on to something with a little more sustenance. You had your cranberry sauce. Now it's time to eat uh, you know, something uh, better for your constitution. Some vegetables. Maybe uh, deep fried tofurkey, if you will. Uh, on to the main course, I suppose. Um, writer and podcaster Daniel Denver, host of Jacobin's podcast, The Dig, and author of All American Nativism, a book out on Verso Books, was kind enough to join us and uh, talk to me and Anders about the 20th anniversary of the battle in Seattle. And we talked a little bit about some thoughts that I think Daniel has synthesized in an upcoming piece which will be out in Jacobin. I'll come back and link to it when it comes out. It should be out not long after this podcast, but I think we're going to come out a little bit before it. Anyways, if you're not familiar with the battle in Seattle, it happened 20 years ago in 1999, in uh, obviously in Seattle, during a time when anti-globalist thought was something that was bubbling in the left, but the left, as we'll discuss, was less socialist and more anarchist. And you might think of these 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 um, little one-offs um, as sort of a nascent predecessor to what will come later in the Occupy movement, and then after that in the Black Lives Matter movement, and then finally in uh, you know where we are today with a full-on sort of um, electoral movement with, uh, you know, Daddy Bernie and everything. It's interesting to track the history, which Daniel lays out in his piece and which he's going to talk to us about. The battle in Seattle was a bunch of crusty anarchists and um, also labor organizers and all sorts of people, you know, coalitions that make up these movements, uh, protesting the World Trade Organization. A lot of these people dressed like sea turtles <laughs> and um, were tear gassed by police while dressed as sea turtles. Crazy. Um, <laughs> there were uh, a, a quote unquote, is a popular term for the time, a diversity of tactics. There were obviously some nonviolent protesters, some uh, people just sort of sitting in to protest. And um, there were also people that. Smash some Starbucks windows. This is, might be where the cliche of smashing a Starbucks window comes from. It's Battle Seattle. Um, it's something that, you know, caused a, a narrative in 
local and cable news that is persistent even today in that, you know, they, they try to like, um, demonize smashing a window as violence when we all know it's, you know, destruction of property is, uh, quite the opposite. It's not violent. It's just destruction of property. Um, all this stuff originates 20 years ago in Seattle. Um, Um, if you want to learn more about it, you might watch a documentary called This Is What Democracy Looks Like, which Anders will be referring to in this interview quite a bit. Um, all in all, I think it's important to look back at 20 years of the left in America um, to track a few things and to sort of gain a um, an understanding of like how we got here and uh, what's different and why it's different. So... Something that's interesting about the 90s left, the sort of Gen X, early millennial left, is um, that a lot of it was based in reaction to globalist trade movements like the, uh, like obviously like NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, you know, there are echoes in America of movements like the Zapatista movement in Chiapas, uh, which was obviously in regards to Clinton's NAFTA. And yeah, like we are going to discuss, a lot of it was anarchistic and horizontalist. And although there was a coalition with unionists and, uh, you know, and, and teamsters and people like that, it was a while before this all synthesized in what we have now to today as a mission with a very like capital S socialism as the goal um, or an openly stated socialism. So, you know, it's important to look back and learn from the past, I suppose. Um so we'll talk a little bit about the evolution of the American left, the American center, the American right, and um, what you should be yelling at your relatives tonight at Thanksgiving, your liberal relatives, mostly. Um, good luck with the other ones. You know, there's really no no um, manual on how to deal with those fuckers. Just go in no holds barred, I suppose. Um, knock a MAGA hat off of someone tonight, folks. Have fun in there, you know. Get drunk, play Mario Kart afterwards. It doesn't matter. It's just your family. You're not going to change your mind. Okay. Anyways, uh, enjoy. Lock them into our positions of hopelessness with and Denver. helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three strike law, and then wants us to sing "God Bless America." No, no. Everyone, this is Jake. Uh, now I'm talking with Anders Lee and our guest Daniel Denver. Welcome Thank to the you. show. Thanks for having me. Yes, uh, Daniel is the host of Jacobin Radio's The Dig, as well as a, a writer coming out with a book, and just wrote an article uh, for Jacobin that's going to be dropping pretty soon about the left, the millennium era left. I guess uh, I would call it. Although there's a lot of different monikers assigned to this sort of. Phenomenon. Old, old millennial, young, young Gen X, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that could be. I'm that old one. Is that uh, X millennials. <laughs> X millennials. Well, that's something I actually wanted to ask. Is like what? Because there's so many different. There's uh, an, the anti-globalization movement, as it was called at the time, the alter globalization movement, global justice movement. Do you have a preferred moniker, or you're you know, I think some people are a little protective about not calling it the anti-globalization movement because it's like, no, we're for different types of globalization. But that was definitely the most common um, way that it was discussed. So it probably, I think, people probably referred to it internally, like in the in the movement most often is the global justice movement. And then like occasion, I mean, 
I don't know. I didn't hear ultra globalization didn't really catch on for obvious reasons. It sounds a little funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds like we want to spin the world in a different globalization, way. but with psychedelics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so for some of our younger listeners who may not have grown up with that right. term globalization, uh, what did it mean in, in the nineties? What was that economic process? What was that? What, what was the significance of the term globalization? It, it was the, you know, idea that that free trade agreement and like NAFTA and like the free trade area of the Americas, which would have essentially expanded NAFTA through the entirety of the Western hemisphere, um, I think at least nearly the entirety of the Western hemisphere, as well as international financial institutions like the IMF and World Bank were putting in place a system that facilitated ever greater capital mobility across the globe, protecting um, those the, those corporations from any kind of democratic governance, thus undermining workers' rights and the environment and public health standards all over the place. And in the you know during the two thousand during the early nineties, um, you know organized labor was at the lead of, of opposing bills like like NAFTA, but mostly, you know, after the end of the, the Cold War, it was this period of neoliberal triumphalism where you had in the U.S. the rise of Reagan um, and in the U.K. Thatcher. And then in both countries, you then had people from the, the kind of social democratic, purportedly social democratic opposition parties, the Democratic Party and the Labour Party, um, embracing neoliberalism themselves. Blair in the UK, Clinton in the US, and that really consolidated the power of neoliberalism because there was no, both of the main parties in both countries were entirely behind it. And so there was this, um, it was, the 90s were like a really crappy time for the, the left. There was not really a sense that there, 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 were, there, were not, there were not strong movements and let alone any sort of sense that the US left might might reasonably aspire to governing and transforming society, which is what we're very much focused on today. And then in the late 90s, with the WTO protests, suddenly that all changed. It all seemed, it suddenly seemed possible that we, that we could stop the system. And it was, it, it's hard to emphasize for people who aren't, younger people who aren't aware of it today, just how big a deal this this was, it was tens of thousands of, of, of protesters who just shut down one of the most important meetings for globalizing capital, the WTO meetings in Seattle. And suddenly what seemed impossible was possible. And it really felt, and it's really hard to convey this, I think, across time. At the moment, it was a really big deal. And it felt like this was going to be sort of like the movement that defined our our lives t- lifetimes. And we did not... I don't think anyone involved knew that it would come to an end so quickly in the U S really in like a matter of matter of two years. Mm. So talk about that moment that what, what happened in Seattle, I understand you weren't there personally, but you were following it very yeah. closely. Uh, what is your, your recollection of that, uh, that time? Yeah. Well, I just turned, I just turned 17 and, <laughs> and um, Happy thank birthday. you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> way to do that math. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we're at the anniversary, yeah, we're on the anniversary right? not only of the wto protest but of my birth more importantly um, <laughs> and uh and you know i'd been getting kind of like in like in, interested in in left politics and paying attention to like noam chomsky lectures and the drug war and thinking about mass incarceration and starting to read progressive publications and then all of a sudden there were these protests going on in seattle and there was um you know there's all kinds of like disparaging and uh coverage in in the mainstream media which we like much more commonly called than the corporate media I, I like bernie still talks in those like kind of old school left terms of corporate media you don't hear it much, much like younger leftists today i mean not that younger leftists don't oppose the mainstream media but the term corporate media i feel like was very much from that era of uh right. kind of the, the shoot your television yes era. definitely i, I yeah Bernie still uh, still reads ad okay. busters and gets really pissed yeah, off. Yeah, no, I, I I subscribed. I I was a high school subscriber to ad busters, without a doubt. And uh, and 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 then suddenly these protests erupted, 
And I was able to log on to this website called Indie Media, which uh, April Glasser has a great article on this from a few weeks or months back in, in Logic Magazine. Um, but it, it started, I believe, in, in Seattle to, to cover the protests. And it was like u- user-generated articles and videos and photos and more than a million people went to indie media that week to see what was going on there because it was um how how to phrase it it just it, 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 it change seems so impossible in the 90s and actually successfully preventing the wto from meeting like it created like the possibility of possibility, but we were just sort of like scratching at what that might look like. The whole idea of like another world is possible was what emerged then. The problem was, and I'm sure we'll get into this, like the movement very quickly just became very obsessively focused on attempting to replicate the success in Seattle. And I was at a few of these things. We like sort of like derisively criticized ourselves uh, for it as, as, as engaging in summit hopping where we went from like to, 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 to the meetings of the global elite everywhere and attempted to shut them down, but it never worked again after Seattle. The cops didn't, the cops figured it out. <laughs> um, I know what you mean in the, and it's trying to articulate the, uh, possibility of something even then being then possible. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the way you put, these events out on a timeline in your piece because it made me think about how these um <clears throat> the like that happened that feeling of the possibility being possible like a few times over and i guess in my younger life uh it was just occupied right. felt the same way right. you know one big thing of maybe it happening and then it's sort of fizzling out and then this wave of uh, nihilism sort of coming over you and then holy crap, Bernie happens and, you know, it just feels like it keeps sort of coming in these like, um, you know, waves or whatever like that. Yeah. But the waves have gotten like a lot more powerful, I think in the sense that the notion that it would be plausible. Oh, now we're full on rolling, yeah, yeah, but yeah. at first yeah. it was, you know, we're just coming up. Yeah. And, and occupy like occupy is very much like sort of the second, a, 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 a briefer second coming of the anti-globalization movement in its kind of insistence on, on, on saying no to the powers that be and articulating the importance of there being a different type of world, but being very unclear about what that might look like and what sort of organized power would be necessary, you know, to build, to make that, that happen. But the thing is like when the WTO, when, when the global justice movement collapsed, it collapsed, but, with the onset of the war on terror and then the two thousands were just utter, utter shit. Whereas when like when Occupy was finally cleared by police, it was kind of like time for Occupy to end and for the left to move on to the other things. And immediately there were already like massive militant immigrant rights protests resisting the Obama administration. Then we have black lives matter and then Bernie. And so since Occupy, there's been pretty consistent militant left mobilization and looking back 20 years, I mean, the most, the closest thing to a, a positive, like state power oriented project that we had in the U S left in the global justice movement was Ralph Nader's 2000 green party presidential campaign. And our goal there, if I remember correctly, was just to get him 5% of the vote, 5% so that the green party could receive federal matching funds. And that felt so radical, but in retrospect, so incredibly unambitious. Fuck. Now we have like a plausible chance of electing Bernie Sanders president. That's. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even, yeah. Well, what do you think would have happened if Nader had run in the Democratic primary? Because he had, uh, if I understand this correctly, he, his father told him to never register as, as a candidate like for one of the two main parties like he, he said like i want you to die an independent like me. <laughs> so because of that nader didn't run as a democrat but you know maybe history would be completely different yeah i don't you know i don't know that the balance of forces was such that that he could have defeated al gore i mean if you think about the other types of of candidates that were considered progressive, quote unquote, challengers to establishment Democrats during that era. 
um, Howard Dean, who really is there's nothing interesting about Howard Dean except that he proposed the Iraq war, which is great, but that's like a really low bar. And then he was like supposedly disqualified because he yelled out like a Yelp at a campaign rally once or like John Edwards, just like mentioning class. He's like, oh, he's the labor candidate because he like acknowledges yeah. that there's inequality in this country. It was not um, the Bush administration, I think, was like very traumatizing to like a lot of the left of center. And there just wasn't. Um, um, I don't know that there was like an appetite for for Bernie type candidacy, though Nader and Bernie are very different in, in important ways, in ways that involve Bernie being much better. But that's another story. <laughs> I am curious about that. But uh, at the time, though, it is heartening to look back and see the sort of coalitions that came together in Seattle because you had environmentalists dressing up uh, as turtles. Yeah. (laughs) uh, But you also had the labor movement, which is very active uh, at the WTO protests. They also, I believe, on the West Coast, shut down basically every major. The ILWU. Yeah. Um, Yeah which is kind of pretty incredible. Um, but at the same time, in, in terms of sort of analytically and ideologically, this is my perception as someone who like, wasn't really there at the time. I was, you know, a little <laughs> kid. But it's, it's you're a reactionary like little kid movement. and not involved in the movement. Wow. Wow. I you think being a big <laughs> oh. excuse. <laughs> well, I, I do remember trying to argue with my sister about no logo. Cause she read no logo. And I, I didn't, I barely knew how to read, but it's like, I think that's wrong. I think, <laughs> but, and later I came around and I would uh, actually cross out the logo on yeah. my clothing. Uh, <laughs> that's very yeah, 90. Really. It was very kind of anti. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was doing this in like 2008. So people were like, this is here. Well, yeah, sorry. Too late. How, old? Was like, okay. how old were you, Anders? <laughs> I was I was seventeen at the time, and I was like get just becoming obsessed with this stuff that would have been. I wish I was your age. That would have been awesome. I would have got to participate, but I uh, was too young to really understand these things. But uh, in retrospect, though, it did kind of look like there were two sort of ideological yeah. poles. There was that like Naderite progressive yeah. liberal pole, and sort of an right. anarchist uh, left that you know was all about direct action. Do you think there was sort of an absence of yeah. socialist Marxist yes. critique there? Is I mean, there were person? socialist organizations, and I considered myself a socialist at the time, but none of them really attract. Like my main exposure to the socialist organizations that existed in the late '90s was them attempting to sell me newspapers outside of like a, you know like a Noam Chomsky lecture or something. Um, right. I didn't really see the point um, in, in engaging. I like specifically engaged with like anti sweatshop organizing, uh, you know, against like the gap in Nike. And, uh, as a teenager, I had to work with like the rainforest action network opposing like Occidental oil building a pipeline through indigenous territory in Colombia. There were all these like very specific and all, and, and to, to its credit, very like global kind of like oriented things, but it did not all tie together, um, the way it does today with, you know, 10, with, with, with this, just, amazingly large numbers of people in the United States being willing to name name their project as and goal as socialism and having a, pre, a plausible presidential candidate who is also a self-identified socialist. Like that dynamic was not there. Anarchism was extremely pervasive, um, both formally in terms of like organized kind of black bloc anarchists who smashed up windows in Seattle, which then the media obsessed about, but then also the movement obsessed about it. We had these just fucking interminable conversations about diversity of tactics. Um, you know, and then, cause like people would stupidly accuse the anarchists of, of being like violent and they'd be like, but property destruction, they'd correctly say property destruction is not violence. But then what would be lost was like the tactical wisdom of the window smashing. I have no problem with smashing Starbucks windows hypothetically, but then like that all got lost. Um, and but then there was also kind of just like a more informal anarchism um, that pervaded the movement in terms of like radical horizontalism and uh, and I think just not not serious not seriously thinking through what state how we got 
how we would get from like square one to revolutionary transformation of society. Um, and I think that we have, I think that we have yeah. like some of that legacy today in good sense. Like, like we, we the things were too anarchist then, but, um, but I like that. Like today's socialist movement is, is radically democratic, maybe sometimes to a fault, but you know, and I, um, I will thank our anarchist forebearers for that influence, you know. Somebody had to yeah. dress up like well, a turtle and get tear gas exactly. to start this whole thing <laughs> off. Exactly. We were figuring it out. <laughs> right. Well, the, I, I went to uh, a, a screening over the weekend of uh, This Is What Democracy yes. Looks Like. Classic. Uh, Classic Audrey uh, Prop from late 90s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they had some of the some people there who were who were at the battle in Seattle and something they were saying. And these were I think they were anarchists. They were saying that their analysis at the time was that the state is irrelevant, mm. that what matters now are these um, multinational institutions, right. the Bretton Woods institutions. Right. And the way we take them down is by confronting them physically and stopping them from being able to meet. Uh, but it turned out after. 9-11 the state is still relevant <laughs> like it or not um and that was a as you mentioned before that was a big turning point in the movement uh but th- from what i have heard there was another confrontation planned for late at September the imf world bank meetings 2001 yeah. yeah that was supposed to be like even bigger than wto um so if i could just get your sense of where you felt things were going at that time and the way 9-11 kind of uh, more or less destroyed this, not destroyed, but really um, put a damper on this. Stuff. It's hard to say where it was going because like, even though there were like very effective, you know, like big um, powerful mass protests after Seattle, I was at the, the IMF world bank, protests in April on April 16th um, 2000 in DC which it, it was I think pretty much like the second big one after following Seattle which we called a 16 that was Seattle was n30 there was this whole kind of nomin mm-hmm. going on um, and uh, and then there was the Quebec City um, there were the there was the DNC in Los Angeles. You were I was at, at the one, DNC. Right? Yeah. I, I uh, um, and, and, you know, there's just like an incredibly like repressive police response that was shutting down protests everywhere. And uh, yeah. And the sense was just sort of like denouncing the democratic party for being everything that they were, which was, you know, correct on our part, but I, I don't know where it was all going. Cause there was already this sense that, that we needed to turn away from so-called summit hopping to more concrete institution and movement building. Um, but we'll never know where it would have gone. Like there, so there were, there were already problems within the movement, but I don't know how those would have played out if the September 11th attacks hadn't happened and the war on terror hadn't started because then all of a sudden, like this growing sense that we can piece together environmentalists and youth radicals and organized labor. We should emphasize, I think I kind of like threw you off earlier when you're going to ask about this organized labor was just a massive part in, in Seattle in part because the Pacific Northwest is kind of a bastion of labor radicalism, but also like all kinds of like more mainstream unionists, like Jimmy Hoffa junior of the Teamsters were, you know, deeply involved and, and, and seemed, the labor movement as a whole seemed like they were very much um, excited about the possibilities that these coalitions would, that they'd shied away from in in the past would offer. But anyways, like where that all would have gone, like this, this uh, possibility of, um, of a big coalition, it, it all, it all, it all got blown up with with, with 9-11 and suddenly instead of this like global many against the few politics we had a clash of civilization and it's and it's hard to like emphasize just how psychotic this country was after september 11th for like the first few months and maybe a year or so there was no space 
I protested the invasion of Afghanistan. That those were extremely small protests. Um, we're talking like ten people. Yeah, and there was, and I was in college in Portland, Oregon, and there were, and that city was dra- you know, draped in American flags. That was just normal everywhere. That's hard to imagine. Just yeah, uh, been to Portland. Mm-hmm. It's one of the more openly <laughs> crunchy wow. left cities, right? But right. yeah, I mean, I, I remember just like culture back then everything was like uh you know big trucks and american flags and like yeah. pop country music and shit there was kind of a like a amnesia for a short while yeah and then like people right. there was like a real kind of re-excitement of mass movements around the invasion of iraq iraq those protests were big um in portland when i was you know what like sophomore in college or something, we sh- like we shut down the entire city. We shut down I-5. Like it was like a massive protest. I think on a global scale, these are the largest protests still, maybe. Maybe the climate strike is bigger now, but they were the largest protests in, um, in world history. But then they just, when they failed to stop the war, it, no real anti-war movement after the war started really ever took powerful root. And that was like the end of it. <laughs> and do you think this experience, uh, if nothing else, did kind of prepare you for Obama and have have like a ready made skepticism for when he came into office? Yeah, I mean, like I was at the point in in uh, in two thousand eight where my radical pr- my my radicalism plus like a- aged heart pragmatism meant that I. Uh, that I was, uh, I was still, I was still, I had just moved to Philadelphia, but I was still registered to vote in, in Oregon. So I, which was a safe state. So I voted for the Green Party candidate in Oregon and knocked on doors for Obama in Philly. (laughs) 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 But yeah, no, I mean, I I think most like the, the radical F was generally like very wary of, Obama because they saw that he was not a leftist, but were, um, you know, but there, but, but, but that, but that was like a, that was like a pretty marginal critique initially, like every kind of like the vast majority of America from center to left, from center to left was, um, overwhelmed with euphoria when Obama was elected. Um, it seemed like the right. end of all of, of all of all the problems and little did we know that like the biggest problem that the system had ever created was like incubating within the Obama years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as others have pointed out, I, it's not a coincidence that during the tenure of the first black president, you have a, a mass movement for right. racial justice. Um, and that's actually brings me to one of, I guess, the critiques of the millennium era left is that there was sort of a lack of, I guess, uh, racial awareness or it was, you know, um, that obvious, I mean, if you look at the, what happened in Seattle, there were a lot of indigenous mm. people from around the world who came to coalesce, but, you know, just watching the documentary, this is what democracy looked like. There's a, there's a scene in the beginning where they're talking to the police kind of before things heat up and they're like, we want to, we want to get along. Let's make sure this doesn't get violent. And they even say, they're like, who's yeah. Yes. I just rewatched that. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, weird. Yeah. Chance. That's, that's cringy. Yeah. I don't think that would, right. <clears throat> that's not something we would probably say today. Is that right? Yeah. Though I think, though I do, at, at least the, in the part of the left I was involved in at the time, opposition to, mass incarceration at the moment that it was really, you know, consolidating into the, into its truly most monstrous forms under, under Clinton. And that was like a big, that was definitely like a big, um, focus of the left at that time. I can't really say why those particular protesters were chanting this cop. It was, it was, um, it was a very internationalist, you know, movement as well in the sense that it really um a lot of the summits were in the global north because that's where like the global elites traditionally gather but 
uh, even as the movement kind of started to fall apart in the U.S., the sort of second phase of it, the World Social Forum phase, took root in Latin America, starting in Brazil. And um, I would say that, like, in the 90s, like, the Zapatistas were, like, an enormous reference point. Um, mm -hmm. And, I mean, the Zapatistas are rad, but, like, to, you know, maybe to, like, an excessive like idea that this this one thing happening in the state of Chiapas is like a model for the entire world. I think the idea that being so persuasive was in some ways a result of the pervasiveness of anarchism on the left at the time. Um, that we can just take a mic that that one micro model is also a macro model, um, which it not isn't necessarily. But anyways, but then in the two thousands with the World Social Forums. You have the rise of the pink tide government with like Lula winning power in either 2002 or 2003. I don't remember. Um, and then all these other, you know, you already have Chavez um, and you have all these pink tide governments and these massive world social forums in Porto Alegre, Brazil. And it's these Latin American governments at the time and the social, the very powerful social movements that bring them to power that for me and many others in the U.S. left, I think that becomes like the real, the real model for an alternative world. There's not really a concrete model emerging in the U.S. left at that point, but, but Latin America is, is, uh, is consistently a key point of inspiration from the Zapatistas in the, the mid-90s through the Pink Tide in the 2000s. Right. Um, and also there was a lot of, uh, a lot of the rhetoric that was sort of counter globalization in the U.S. anyway was coming from the right. Uh, the right. Pat Buchanan and, you know, in many ways, Trump, who sort of has helped the WTO become uh, a lot less relevant. Uh, but can you talk about the sort of uh, nativist elements to um, anti globalization and how you sort of had to to fight to stave that off and, and uh, prevent them from? Co-opting. Yeah. I mean, part of the, this is more of like an argument that I make in my, my book that's coming out, but it's like the, the consolidation of neoliberalism as a bipartisan project in the 1990s sort of like chokes off for much of that decade, um, meaningful critiques of, of free trade and, and global capitalism from the left. And so it, it emerges from the, the right, most powerfully from Pat Buchanan and it em it emerges as like a very much like what we see today from Trump, at least on a rhetorical level, which is the simultaneous demonization of, of the free movement of, of the global movement of people, labor and of capital. Um, but mostly kind of a scapegoating using the demonization, using opposition to both as a pretext to really like demonize immigrants overall. And then there was Ross Perot, who, I mean, it's really hard to explain his politics because they don't fit into any neat political boxes. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a nativist, really. He was, like, against corruption. He was, uh, um, there was net, he just died this year, and there was, like, no good obits of him. Like, I've, I'm still looking for, like, a great Ross Perot essay. It, it, it's, like, yet to be written, I think. Ross Perot's dead. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, he died a few months ago. Oh, we'll pour one out for him, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah someone we don't want to pour one out the for is uh, Pat Buchanan, who didn't he try to sort of give a speech at the A15, the IMF? Maybe. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, someone, someone wrote that, um, I think perceptively that, that Trump is Pat Buchanan with better timing. I mean, there are a lot of, other differences between them, but, but, uh, and, and I think Pat Buchanan is more of like a true, true believer and like, uh, less of like a, mm, I mean, he's not like a clinical narcissist in the way Trump is, et cetera. They're differences, but, um, sorry, I'm scattered right now. <laughs> That's all right. I'll, I'll clean it up in editing. Yeah, good. Sorry, I, I've been on the road and I'm just like, oh. <laughs> I just woke up, so I feel you on that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I just, you know, kind of wanted to lead, let that lead into your your book, uh, which I guess with the time we, we have left, why don't we uh, hear about that, What where people can find it and what uh, kind oh, yeah. of the rest of it. 
Well, it'll be out in January uh, 14th from Verso. It's called All American Nativism, How the Bipartisan War on Immigrants Explained Politics as We Know It. And the alternate title could be Trump, Obama, Bush, and Clinton did it. Because <laughs> this whole idea of like, this is not normal. I mean, there are things that are, of course, like patently abnormal about Trump, like on a personal personality level. Like I've never met someone that bizarre and deranged ever in my life like he's he's arguably it, it is it is it is abnormal that we have like arguably the most deranged like single most deranged individual on earth as our president um that 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 is not normal i get that but the liberal insistence that all of this is not normal is a big problem because in fact it was politics like very normal politics as we've known them for a long time that helped make trump possible very much including on anti on immigration, which of course has been central to Trump's project. And my argument generally, what the story that I tell, in some ways it goes back to the beginning of settler colonialism in North America, but a lot of it, uh, to keep it more concise, from the 1990s on, that you basically have Bill Clinton militarizing the border and demonizing immigrants in an explicit attempt to protect corporate globalization. Um, there's a memo from Rahm Emanuel that's basically like, if we want to maintain good, if we want to maintain NAFTA, we need to show the American public that we're cracking down on illegal cross-border trade, i.e. drugs and people. So it's very much an explicit project to scapegoat immigrants for the problems that are being caused by neoliberalism and globalization. And then with, with Bush, that gets sort of linked to the, to, the, to the war on terror. And ultimately, as the war on terror starts to fall apart, like all of those anxieties and uh, all of that politics of scapegoating from the 90s reemerges as really powerfully around 2005 it gets attached to anti-Muslim sentiment. So now you have like nativism that's simultaneously anti-Mexican and anti-Muslim. And the way that Bush responds to it, because he wants to, he wants a comprehensive immigration reform bill that's gonna create a path to citizenship for the vast majority of undocumented immigrants. But what he does is increasingly increase deportations, militarize the border. He gets, uh, he had, in 2006, the Secure Fence Act passes, which leads to the construction of 650 miles of fencing on the border. Hillary Clinton voted for it. Barack Obama voted for it. Joe Biden voted for it. Um, Bernie Sanders voted against it. And there's this idea that deporting more and more people, building more and more fencing, will finally convince extreme right-wing anti-immigrant people to vote for comprehensive immigration reform. That doesn't happen, but then Obama tries to do the same thing. He achieves record deportations, more deportations than any president in history, and yet still the right wing will not pass a comprehensive immigration reform bill. They won't even pass the DREAM Act to give legal protections for young people who came to this country as children and basically know no other country, the most sympathetic possible undocumented immigrants. They can't, Repu right-wing Republicans won't even support that. But this whole time, like from Clinton through Bush and Obama, you have these mainstream presidents talking about immigrants and just and justifying border militarization and massive deportations on the basis of immigrants being a, a criminal threat, a terrorist threat, an economic threat. And what I show, I think, pretty clearly in my book is how very mainstream politics creates this link. Both, it both creates the language that Trump use, uses and the quite literally like the institutions through which he's doing all of this damage. Um, the last time I checked, Trump was still struggling to catch up to, to match Obama's deportation records. So, um, yeah. This is all too normal. It's basically my argument. So you're saying that Donald Trump didn't invent racism in 2015? <laughs> I'm not I'm not buying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, it, you know. If we defeat Trump, I just think that we're gonna immediately end. You know, anybody 
uh, but Trump in, in 2020, and then everything becomes back to normal, which means good, and then there's no more climate change, mass incarceration and uh, open borders, all things will be very still. Yeah. There will be no problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, to your actual serious point. Um, yeah, I think you're I, absolutely right, and it's super important that people understand that timeline and those material and narrative reasons that we were able to get to something like Trump. Cause yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Otherwise uh, this just happens all over again and treating Trump as a little aberration and getting someone with a prettier face in office does nothing and will just lead all this all over again. So um, this is what you should be yelling at your family over Thanksgiving. If this comes out on time, uh, <laughs> definitely yell at your family. Yeah. <laughs> Yell this this part at the libs yeah. who think you know we just get rid of Trump and then everything's yeah. fine. No, you yeah. got to dig way way far back into the the roots of all this stuff. Yeah, I mean Clinton, Bill Clinton said in sometime in the nineties, and he was a radio address, like uh, maybe it was State of the Union address. I don't know, some sort of address. He says, you know, we are of course a nation of immigrants, but we will not tolerate those immigrants whose first act upon entering this country is to break the law, i.e., by being undocumented and crossing illegally. Um, and that's wow. there, there's consistent sort of rhetoric along these lines from, you know, very mainstream politicians. If people look up uh, Bill Clinton's presidential ads from 1996 and also Bob Dole's, um, I mean, Trump's, Trump just won't seem like such an anomaly. Lo- just like vicious. vicious. I think you make a good point in that um, each of the predecessors to Trump characterized the immigrant as a different type of threat. And then he, as a true you know, show business character, was able to synthesize them into a triple threat, right? Which is a showbiz term. They're an economic threat. They're a racial threat. They can sing. They can dance. You know, these people got to be stopped, right? And, 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 and like for Trump, yeah, like, like, the kind of like the, the the scapegoating of immigrants as an economic threat, as a criminal threat, as a cultural threat, um, a linguistic threat, it all comes together and becomes Trump's sort of like great replacement existential threat. Like immigrants are coming to murder and rape Americans, like i.e. like they are going to replace Mexicans are going to replace white people. You know, that is like the the fundamental like point that it gets to with Trump. But all of the ingredients were provided by his predecessor. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Guys. Um, yeah. Go ahead and uh, plug anywhere our listeners can find you. Obviously, the dig um, and your writing, et cetera. Uh, plug away. I'm on I'm on, uh, on 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 Twitter as my name, Daniel Denver. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> and the dig is available you know from any podcast outlet <laughs> cool all right cool you guys want to uh, get yeah go, yeah go ahead plug away Andrew. Plug, plug, cool at Anders Lee here on twitter and i uh am have doing a an hour of comedy about the history of the autistic spectrum and how it goes back to the eugenics movement uh that'll be in New York City at the Crane Theater, December 7th at 8, 10 p.m. Cool. Um, this should be out Thanksgiving Day, I believe. So in about a week, I'll be in the Southwest, um, Phoenix, Tucson, Bisbee, for some reason. Um, I'll be doing some stand-ups, some house shows, some bar shows, and uh, the Moth Grand Slam. I'm coming to, uh, to win the Moth. Um, this is a threat to all the storytellers in the Southwest I'm coming to take your belt. <laughs> those, those yeah. Across yeah, the yeah. I'm coming to take a uh, white person's right. job, which uh, wow. dramatic storytelling is very much a white person's <laughs> job. I am to understand. So, um, <laughs> yeah, nothing is sacred. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. So be warned. Um, yeah. And then all, all dates and everything on my website and Twitter. That's it. And let's uh, sign up for our Patreon for bonus stuff. Uh, that, that I think that's it for the week. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Have a good one. All right. See you guys. Appreciate it. See you.